Hello again. Uh, this is another story from the short stories book. And this one's called George Starts School. So this would be quite an interesting one, won't it? I expect Merrin might be interested. Let's hope she can watch it and listen to it as well. George Starts School. One morning, not long after George's fourth birthday, his mother was watching him as he sat at the breakfast table reading the Financial Times. His father had just left for work, taking George's 11-year-old sister Laura with him to school. Just think, George, said his mother, only two more terms and then you'll be going to school too. You'll be a rising five. I am aware of my age, mother, said George, turning a page, with difficulty because the newspaper was very large. And sometimes I feel it. You'll like school, won't you, George, said his mother. George put down the Financial Times with a sigh. The answer to that question, he said, can only be hypothetical. Whether I shall like school, as you put it, has yet to be proven. Judging by what I, by what I read of the new curriculum, I shall not. Why? Is it too difficult? Too easy, said George, and he picked up the newspaper once more. It was his mother's turn to sigh. A sigh partly of resignation to the fact that George always had the last word and partly of pride at her most unusual son. She sat drinking her coffee and remembering how fantastically early George had learned to speak, how fluent he was in the English language when less than six months old. Neither she nor her husband had ever known, because Laura had never re revealed it, that in fact George was holding long conversations with his sister a mere four weeks after his birth when he knew a great deal more than she did, including his multiplication tables. It's a pity, she said reflectively, that there's a seven-year gap between you and Laura. When you go to primary school, she'll have left. Just as well, said George. What do you mean? Don't you like your sister? Mother, said George patiently, I am in point of fact extremely fond of Laura, but I'm perfectly accustomed to doing without her during the day. Things will be no different... And there's Laura having a conversation with George when he was a, a baby in the pram. Yes, but when Laura's at school, I'm always with you, George. I shan't be then. You'll be all alone. According to Laura, said George, there are 150 children at the school, which I am to attend, not to mention all the teachers, the secretary, the dinner ladies, the caretaker and the odd job man. I shall not be alone. His mother remembered these last words on the day, eight months later, when she walked, holding George by the hand through the playground, full of hordes of rushing, yelling children. She looked down at her little son, so much smaller, it seemed, than nearly all the others, and saw that he was frowning. It's sure to be strange at first, George, she said, but I'll be here to fetch you after school, don't worry. I'm not worried, mother, said George, merely appalled at the noise and general confusion. How childishly everyone is behaving. In class five, the reception class, the teacher, who was also new at the school and had never before set eyes on George or any of the other children, was filling in her register. Everyone had been shown a peg to hang their coats on and a locker to keep their things in and given a place to sit and some crayons and paper to draw on. As each new child in turn was called to the teacher's desk, she wrote down their names in the register and, if they knew them, their dates of birth. Now then, who are you? she asked when it was George's turn. My name, said George, is George. And do you know when your birthday is, George? It is April the 1st, said George. April Fool's Day, said the teacher, smiling. George did not smile. You will find, he said severely, that I am nobody's fool. Later, the teacher went around looking at the pictures the children had drawn. Some were of their animals, some of their houses, some of their parents, and one little girl had actually written Mum under her picture. That's very good, said the teacher. Then she came to George. If people's eyes could really pop out of their heads, George's new teacher would have gone blind at that instant. For George's picture, minute in detail, was of a motorcycle. Under it was written in joined-up writing, 1988, Honda Goldwing Aspencade. And there's the picture. It's not bad for a rising five, is it? I think he's a very clever boy. George gasped the teacher. What in the world? 
I am interested in motorcycles, said George, amongst other things. This is a Japanese Tourer. It has a flat 4, 1182cc engine and a 5-speed gearbox with transistorized ignition. That's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? George's second day at school was spent in class 4, and by the end of the week he was in class 1 among the 10 and 11-year-olds. The children treated him with the awed respect they might have accorded to an alien from outer space, and the teachers were quite simply flabbergasted. The headmaster had at first paid little heed to rumours of George's abilities, but that Friday was one that he never forgot. In the morning he taught class one. At lunchtime he summoned George to his study. Sit down, George, he said in a kindly voice. I can't, said George. Why not? I fear the chair is too high for me, said George. So the headmaster lifted him on foot. Now, George, he said, I just want to ask you some questions. How old are you? Four years and eleven months, said George. They tell me you can do joined up writing. Up to a point, said George. My physical skills are inferior to my mental abilities. Ah, said the headmaster in a shaky voice. What about numbers? Mathematics, do you mean, said George. My knowledge is purely in the realm of arithmetic so far. Algebra and geometry are treats in store for me. Uh, and reading, croaked the headmaster. Reading, said George, is something I find most enjoyable. There are a great many excellent children's authors published these days, but I must confess to a weakness for the older classics. Take, for example, Alice in Wonderland. What a work of fantasy. Fantastic, whispered the headmaster. After lunch, class one was working on a project about South America, drawing maps and putting in the capital cities and principal rivers and mountain ranges. To be fair to the headmaster, he knew the names of the capitals of most of the countries of South America. But on one, he momentarily stumbled. The capital of Guyana is, he said. Silly of me, it slipped my mind. Look it up, someone. No need, said a very young but already familiar voice. It's Georgetown. That evening, George went to bed early. I'm quite tired, he said to his parents. And Laura, it's been a busy week. There he is, in bed, tucked up. It's amazing, said his father later, to be in the top class his first week of school. He's top of the top class, said his mother. He's miles cleverer than me, said Laura proudly. He won't need me for help with homework. I'll need him. George's mother sighed. This time it was a deep sigh of pure regret. I just wish he needed me still, she said. He never seems to, not now. Just then there was an awful wailing from upstairs. It was a terrified wailing, the cry of a very young child that desperately wanted his mother. Mummy, 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 cried George from the darkness of his bedroom. I'm coming, my baby, called George's mother. Mummy's coming. And she rushed upstairs to find George sitting up in bed, sobbing his heart out. This was not the confident, self-assured, know-it-all cleverest child in the school. This was just a frightened baby, and she cuddled him as fiercely as she had when he was only tiny and had never spoken a word. What is it, George, darling, she said as she mopped away his tears. Did you have a bad dream? I did, I did, mummy, sobbed George. What was it? Tell mummy. Gradually, George's sobs turned to sniffles, and then he blew his nose and said, I dreamt we were doing a science test at school. A science test? Yes, we do science in the new curriculum, you know. And there was a simple question in it that I couldn't answer, and I cried like a baby. I cried in the dream, and I was crying when I woke up. I really must apologise for behaving so childishly. Poor lamb, said his mother. What was the question? It was the order of events in the cycle of the internal combustion engine, said George. Forget about it, George, said his mother sadly. I expect there'll be lots of questions you won't know the answers to. Not if I can help it, said George. Anyway, don't worry. Just go back to sleep. Mummy's here. And there he is with his mummy. Oh, I shan't worry any more, mother, said George in his usual confident tones. I've remembered it now. It's induction. Compression, ignition, exhaust. 
and exhausted, he lay back and went happily to sleep. Well, now there's a very clever boy. Most children are not that clever at that age. But it doesn't matter. Everybody learns things at their own pace. Anyway, cheerio for now. Bye.